Thank you so much for tuning in again today. I have quite a few introductions to do because I have five industry experts joining me on the panel today that will discuss the roadmap to recovery question mark, the tourism industry post-COVID. First, I'd like to introduce Penny Spencer. Penny is in the travel industry for more than 30 years and she's the managing director of the Spencer Group of Companies. Uh, Penny was named in the Smart Companies list of Australia's top 30 female entrepreneurs in 2017 and also in Travel Weekly's Women in Travel Power list in 2016. Penny's very passionate for mentoring, uh, so she founded the Travel Industry Mentoring Experience, which you're listening to the podcast, in 2009. She's a strong believer in lifelong learning, gratitude and integrity. We also have Michelle Allen joining us. Michelle is head of travel for Google in Australia. She joined Google in 2011 and has nearly 20 years experience in the travel industry in France, Spain and Australia. She's previously worked for Amadeus. Michelle is passionate about understanding consumer behavior and how travel companies can be more efficient with their branding and distribution by winning the traveler through technology, insights and customer experience. In early 2021, Michelle and team created a bespoke three-part digital education series for the travel industry, part of Grow with Google, which was their first, very first free digital upskilling series for the travel industry in Australia. Michelle is also a mom to two energetic boys and just had her third baby, a little girl, in July 2021. Next up, we have Justin Montgomery. Justin is the general manager of Amadeus IT Pacific Australia and he's an accomplished executive in technology, aviation, hospitality and travel. He's got a proven track record across transformation in all organizational types and sizes, or be they startups, turnaround or growth organizations. His commercial successes include launching new businesses and returning underperforming businesses to profitability, so that makes him an expert for the recovery of the tourism industry post-COVID. We also have Dr. Simon Pawson with us. Simon is the Associate Dean of Hospitality at the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School and he's all about leadership in today's world. He excels at making practical sense of the multiple leadership approaches and he's applying them to achieve effective solutions and results for the ever-changing higher education environment. Now, Simon is very passionate about the theory and practice of leadership, uh, particularly leadership across generations, empowerment, reflective leadership, and leading with a higher purpose. I met Simon one and a half years ago, where he put me on a 1.5 hour live show to the world, and I will put the link in the description box for you. Last, but certainly not least, we have Michael Johnson with us. Michael has extensive experience in the hotel and tourism industry, including the successful relaunch of Park Royal Parramatta in 2016. He then joined Tourism Accommodation Australia in 2019 as their CEO, and he is now working closely with all industry stakeholders. He's best to understand and to know what are the concerns of the hotel industry to move out of this pandemic and to fully swing into the recovery. Hello and welcome back to the Time Podcast. Today I have a panel of industry experts with me to talk about the roadmap to recovery question mark, the tourism industry post-COVID. Uh, please welcome warmly with me Penny Spencer, Michelle Allen, Michael Johnson, Dr. Simon Paulson and Justin Montgomery. Welcome to the show, all of you, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Awesome. I would say let's go... Straight into it. Um, first of all, I'd like to understand how do you currently operate business compared to pre-COVID? What are the changes that you had to implement to be able to survive, probably? And maybe let's start with Penny. Okay. Uh, lean, mean machine is what I would say. <laughs> uh, I was always, you know, pre-COVID, very generous. And we had a um, diamond club that everyone, once they hit 10 years, got a one carat diamond. Well, unfortunately, that's all gone now. So, um, you know, it's it's really going to go forward the same way that we just can't be looking at spending too much money. We've got to catch up. It's mm. a big catch up. So that that's definitely going to be a big difference to our business and our culture. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and Justin, how's things at Amadeus? Yeah, look the same. Look, uh, you know, Armadeus operates in the travel aviation hospitality ecosystem. So, you know, everyone's been impacted and there for ourselves. We've been no different. Uh, you know, we've had staff reductions on a global basis by about 10 to 12 percent. Uh, in some regions heavier than others, um, mm-hmm. and certainly all discretionary spend is gone. Yeah, the way we used to travel, uh, and you know, we used to travel a lot, uh, will certainly in this part of the world will be cut back and it will be required as needed um, or as, as validated and important. Mm-hmm. But getting on a plane to fly to Melbourne for a meeting in the short term uh, probably won't be on the horizon. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I think over the next 12 to 18 months, We'll probably operate in a similar manner to where we are today, and then let's see how the market responds, uh, the industry responds, customers respond, because uh, without them, we're uh, we're not going to be operating. So I think it's it's critical that uh, it's going to take comfort uh, within the corporate and leisure space for people to travel again, uh, and I think that's going to be quite fragmented over the next period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, Simon, education sector, obviously a bit of a different angle towards the industry, but still part of it. Um, you probably had huge changes. Can you highlight a couple for us? Thanks, Timo. We have, um, right across the university sector, there has been massive change. So I'm sure you know all of our viewers are, are well aware of what's happened in the university sector with the shift to online learning and, of course, cutbacks across the university staff, cutbacks and so on. Um, at the hotel school and... Um, of course, our, our, our parent organisation, Torrens University Australia, our focus really has been on innovation, quality experience and, uh, and support. Um, fortunately, we were able to make the transition to online learning very quickly, thanks to Torrens University and the platforms that they'd already established. Um, so for us, it was a fairly easy transition. But then it was ensuring that you know, students had an equal experience online as they would in the classroom and then support the students. What we do know is our international students are desperate to come back and continue their face-to-face experience with us. They're desperate to come back to the country, uh, which is good. And I think, um, you know, as soon as they can get on a plane, they'll be here, which will help boost our international student numbers. But really right throughout the last 18 months, our, our focus, and this is a saying we've been using right throughout the university, is, you know, keep our teachers teaching and our students learning. And that's exactly mm-hmm. what we've done. Um, Michelle, what do you think, how long will it take for, for business owners like Penny and um, other business organizations to catch up on the disaster of the last 24 months? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the impact on the travel industry has obviously been profound over the last, for Australia, it's actually pre-COVID. It was since the bushfires, which was pretty much now two years ago. I think some parts of I read a statistic that said the impact on the Australian travel industry last year was $80 billion, which is obviously an enormous, um, an enormous amount. I think some businesses have fared better than others during the pandemic. I recently read some results from Airbnb and, you know, they, they actually did pretty well versus some of the airlines, for example, over the last 18 months. So I think it's going to depend on what um, segment of the industry that you're operating in. I also read about some of the really high-end hotels in Australia that were booked out for months in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two two phrases which I absolutely love. One is um, revenge travel, uh, which means people are so desperate to travel that they absolutely splash out because they think that they deserve it. The second one is vacation deprivation, and it's the same. People feel so deprived of being able to travel that they really um, spend um, in the luxurious end. So over the last 18 months, I think some of those hotels and um, very high-end hotels have actually done quite well in regional Australia. Mm. Um, I do think, um, though, that we see it from our data that there is an incredible demand for travel. So I do think that when um, borders are opening, which is um, excitingly very soon, uh, that um, a lot of companies will see that volume and consumer demand. I think that there are questions over, um, number one, staffing, making sure that um, hotel chains, resorts, etc., can get enough staff, but also how um, travel companies can be profitable when there are things like um, social distancing or capacity on numbers. Those two things are going to be critical. 
So I'm not exactly sure. I think um, some will be faster than others, but I think it's coming back. I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. yeah, Timo, can I just can I just add to that? I mean, we, we've got data <clears throat> that uh, we're lucky enough to be able to access, which shows the seating capacity that is the airlines have put into systems uh, as far out as say June next year, and we can sort of measure that over the last two or three years. I mean, you know, at the the worst of the pandemic was May last year, where uh, you know, effectively 90% of the seats had been pulled out of systems. If I look at where we are for December this year, um, it's only 13% down. So there is an, the airlines are optimistic enough now to say that, you know, we've got 13%, 13% less than what we did in 2019, but literally the seats uh, and the graph has gone from being right at the bottom. And if I look at the graph now going into 2022, mm. it's going the right trajectory up. And if I look at searches and if I, even if I look at bookings uh, over the last three months, August, September and October, the desire for people to travel, I think the fact that the government uh, has sort of talked around international borders opening up to selected destinations, domestically, we seem to be finding some level of roadmap um, that ultimately we're now seeing not only search and people looking at where they want to go aspirationally, we're actually now seeing bookings. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing bookings right across the market. This is not just at Armadeus, this is the whole market. So, you know, it is now we're starting to see quite a quick rebound because people are deprived of travel and, and they're really wanting to get away December, January, February. So it, that's a really good place. And I think it's, it's you know, definitely green shoots coming. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's definitely a positive sign. Uh, Michael, you obviously hear from a lot of people within the industry. Lots ask you questions, share their concerns, feedbacks. Um, is what Michelle and Justin said kind of in line with what you hear from from people on site? I, I still think we're going to see, um, you know, particularly as as uh, and if I just look at New South Wales opening up uh, next week. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to witness what we've seen before, and that is, uh, again, a two-speed recovery. Our regions are going to be very strong and we'll have a very strong summer. Um, and I think they're, probably their biggest issue is still going to be uh, staffing um, uh, issues. Whereas our CBDs uh, and the CBD Sydney, CBD Melbourne, uh, are, are certainly still got a long road out. Uh, I think on, on picking up on what Michelle was saying, uh, you know, we're definitely seeing the luxury end getting very good occupancies on weekends in CBD, uh, but then dropping way back into very low numbers during the week because there's just no real markets mm. uh, travelling that normally uh, substantiate what those midweek occupancies are. So I think we will see a bit of a two-speed uh, happening. I think uh, we see the return. Once we see borders open, uh, Victorian border open, Queensland border open, etc. And we might start to see that come up, and that's probably more likely to be in uh, early 2022. Mm -hmm. And um, we obviously have a new premier since a few days. Um, what can we expect for the tourism industry? Can, can we expect any changes, if so, positive or negative? Um, what are your, what's your crystal ball reading? We probably don't know, but what's your assumption? Uh, look, I was going to say. It, our, our new Premier had his first uh, press conference this morning and um, I think uh, it was very clear from that that uh, we've got uh, a new broom and, and certainly uh, he's looking to take us in a different direction. He has a very, uh, very pro uh, economy. Let's get the economy going. So yes, we're certainly coming out of a health pandemic, but now we want to to drive it into an economic recovery. And I think that's definitely where he's looking to push. Um, they've already eased some restrictions today. I think the more easings of restrictions uh, at, over the next couple of weeks as well to try and actually uh, get, you know, interesting today with the mask, change of masks indoors from the 80% mark. And that's, that's just a great message because what that's trying to say is let's get back into the CBD. Let's get people back into the offices because no one wants to go and spend five days in the office with a mask on. So I think, you know, there's a real, and, and, and as well, we won't see occupancy come back into the CBD until the CBD is actually mm. live and, and they won't live if no one's back in the CBD. So I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, of positivity in that. My concern is still, we have got big inventory as we know in our CBDs. We, we have a lot of markets that aren't open. 
with uh, international still closed. Uh, also, cruising not happening. I mean, you can just keep ticking yeah. them off. International conferencing, hey, it's it's on the horizon and and it's great. But you know, conferencing, uh, we've got some conferencing coming up in uh, November and December uh, for say ICC Sydney, but it's domestic conferencing. It's it's coming out of Sydney. So realistically, when you start talking about you know driving. Uh, occupancies into the CBD. Yeah, I think we've got a, a slow burn out. But again, weekends will be strong, uh, particularly for the higher end. Uh, but yeah, but the, the government have got uh, stimulation uh, uh, packages coming, and I think that'll certainly help as well. And particularly, you know, we, we were successful in getting a, a CBD accommodation voucher up uh, just prior to going into lockdown. We never actually got it to go. And uh, we're, we're already talking with government about getting that kick-started as soon as we possibly can to drive some business, particularly into um, those midweek days. Mm. Um, so from what I'm hearing, you expect a bit of a positive dynamic um, through the new Premier? Very, very yeah. much so. Very much so. I, I would suggest not as conservative as our previous okay. Premier. Uh, and and not to, not to criticise, but just yeah, the difference of in the... Yeah. the Simon, yeah. would you also expect positive dynamics for the education sector? Look, um, we, we, we talk about latent demand and we've been using this term more and more recently. And I think, you know, um, all of us here today have agreed there is significant demand. And certainly, first of all, we'll see that in our, our regional areas and with regional travel. And then once the borders start to open, that will gradually come back. And of course, that will benefit the education sector. But Timo, the worrying note around this that we have touched on, I think Michelle first first raised this, is, is obviously mm -hmm. labour. Um, we have been hit right across the industry with um, international visitors and, and backpackers and students returning home and they haven't come back. Um, the hotel companies that we work with have made it very clear they are concerned to the extent uh, that they may not be able to reopen some hotels because simply they have no staff to operate these hotels. So we know there is a substantive skill shortage there's also a wider problem, uh, Timo, in relation to that, and that's the overall image um, of the industry for um, especially school leavers in Australia who are considering uh, a career in hospitality, tourism or hotel management. Um, you know, before we went into COVID, certainly the industry was viewed by, by school leavers as essentially like retail, something you do on the way to another career. So a part-time job while you're at uni and so on. And then, of course, COVID came along and now school leavers view the industry as that's the industry you go where you probably work in a quarantine hotel and will end up getting COVID and it's just not going to be as, as fun and exciting as it was. So sort of a double whammy there. So we really, as an industry, have to work together. And that, that's so important, that collaborative approach to address the image problem, to attract talent mm. back into the industry itself, starting with, obviously, domestic, with our school leavers and what we can do and work around, you know, reassuring them that hospitality and tourism is, is still a fantastic Ooh. lifelong career. Um, but we can't do that. The hotel school can't do that by itself or the hotel schools and the universities can't do them by so, and neither can industry individually. You know, we have to collaborate to work out how we improve the image. Then we can tackle how we rebuild the yeah. labor force. No, I fully agree. And I've, uh, Michael, for example, I know has um, discussions with his uh, advisory board exactly about that. You know, how can we get the workforce back into, into tourism in general? Um, hotel is obviously food and beverage does not have a huge reputation to be, uh, the future for, for for the kids of these days. Let me say it that way. Um, um, I, can I yeah. can I add to that? I mean, what's interesting is, you know, in the hotels, uh, you know, the travel agency businesses, the cafes. But I mean, as a technology company, we've had uh, rounds of interviews for developers and even recently a senior HR executive. Mm -hmm. The moment they found out that we were in the travel aviation ecosystem, uh, they pulled out. Mm -hmm. They said there is no, mm -hmm. there is no certainty. And so, you know, I think this is quite a broad issue. I mean, we see all the front facing uh, roles and responsibilities, 
But you know, that to me was quite a telltale that we do have quite a job to do in this in this industry yeah. to attract people. Um, you know, and that that was quite concerning when you've got a HR professional saying, "No, nah, not too sure. Maybe in a couple of years, mm. but not for now." No, fully agree, Michelle. You've been off now for I think uh, twelve months, roughly. Did you have thoughts throughout the whole pandemic if you should go back into travel or do something different? So I've actually been off since July. So where are we up to now? July or oh, three months? Three months. Okay. Um, okay. In that time, never once did I think um, that it was time to get out of the travel industry. I love the travel industry. I think it's um, one of the best industries to work in, even though it's had quite a terrible two years in Australia. I think um, I think that because it, it's you know it, it's it's global. Um, although it hasn't been for us, <laughs> hasn't been for us. But it, there's just so many attractive things about the travel industry. I'm not focusing just on hospitality or restaurants or hotels. I'm just saying overall the travel industry, I think that the demand will come back. I do think in the short term there will be challenges, um, especially because getting talent into Australia, although we used to get a lot of working holiday um, visa holders that would work in um, the industry but I don't think um, once we get back on our feet and I'm so optimistic that we're just about to um, get over that hurdle once we start on our recovery I'm optimistic that people will start coming back to the industry because it is such a vibrant um, positive industry where you're fulfilling people's um, dreams I think maybe some of the skill sets and um, just looking broadly at travel what travel companies I will be looking for or needing um, a big shift to digital has happened over the last um, 18 months. So digital skills, um, but also um, systems. So, for example, call center solutions. COVID has uh, forced many businesses to dramatically change the way that they operate. So things like um, software engineers, cloud, um, digital experts. I think that those skills would be more and more in demand. Mm -hmm. So a question to everyone, actually, and I have this a bit as a panel discussion here. Um, how can we make, first of all, the industry attractive again for, for new starters, but also for people from under industry, other industries potentially thinking about something more exciting? Because travel is definitely exciting either way. <laughs> um, and, yeah, what can we do and how can we upskill people? Uh, if, uh, look, it's interesting if I can just start, Tim. I, I think it's... Um, it was mentioned before, it's, it's going to have to be a collaborative effort right across industry because there's no one fix it. And I think uh, certainly from our perspective, uh, as you would be aware, we, we work with the Department of Employment, we work with uh, TAFE New South Wales, we work with uh, the International Hotel School, with the, with the Hotel School, with you know a number of the bodies um, to actually uh, do our bit to try and encourage people into the industry. Um, we've also got, uh, we're in the process of amalgamating as well and under the amalgamation, uh, the Accommodation Association have got their academy, they've got the pathways uh, grants from government to try and drive drive uh, the youth and the unemployed into the industry as well. So there's a, there's a number of different ways and means. And, uh, and I think, you know, coming back to, to uh, you know, mentoring is, is is still critical as well to ensure that we're mentoring uh, those people. That you, you asked Michelle the question, and, th and that's an interesting question because how many of our executives and managers and middle managers are currently sitting in their roles at the moment thinking, I wonder what this opening up is going to be like. I'm going to give it one last crack because I've been shut down six times in Victoria. If I'm in New South Wales, I've been closed down a couple of times. And let's remember, the hotels, particularly in the CBD, haven't got busy yet since since the pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, they're running most of the hotels. I think Penny mentioned lean and mean. Most of the hotels, you know, are trying to work through a lean and mean environment, which means those that are working are doing it pretty tough. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it is tough at the moment. So we're going to not only have we got to sort of try and attract, we're going to make sure we're looking after those that are currently working for us and, and ensuring that we are mentoring them to uh, particularly those of us uh, that may have a few years on us I say that you know I think you, I think you say we're more mature uh, uh, like cheese but uh, again that have been through uh, the likes of, of uh, you know some of the 
the, the many things that worldly incidents that have happened. And we know this is worse than any, but we've still got through them. We are a resilient industry. And uh, if we look back on them and say, I do remember September 11 and seeing the business just fall away to nothing. Mm -hmm. I do remember the, the GFC and the business falling. You know, so we've been through these before. We've seen it happen. We've survived and come back stronger. I think we're going to survive and come back stronger again, mm -hmm. but we are going to have a shortage. If you think about the working holiday makers, we're over 100,000 working holiday makers down at the moment, and so many of those are so critical to our to our industry, particularly in the seasonality of, of our industry around the country. And, and the other side of it, of course, and as, as Simon rightly said, from a student's perspective, with so many students that aren't here at the moment, I know we've got pilots happening and we're trying to get them back, but they are so critical to our industry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've, we've got some a bit of a tough time ahead and we need this support uh, so that we can get the newbies in as yeah. well. I think the reality is the students are not going to all land at once. No. It's going to be a sort of a staged, um, you know, a, a staged arrival into Australia. We're not expecting um, to um, see students up to their usual numbers at least before the end of mm. next year. Mm. Uh, we believe that's how long it'll take to, to repopulate the campuses. And I certainly think the other sort of universities are in the same headspace mm. around that. But um, certainly Michael's right in relation to, it has to be a collaborative approach as to how we address this. And you know, maybe even Michael want, might want to volunteer for TAA to, to lead a little bit of a round table with key stakeholders, which needs to include government. It does need to include government as to, you know, what do we do, especially domestically, to address the image problem? Uh, and how can we, especially target high schools and, and the secondary schools around Australia um, to give students that reassurance that this is still a fantastic mm. industry. Uh, but I think, you know, we need that round table. We need a strategy and then we need to make sure that strategy uh, is actually If expanded. I can just say something here, I think also you existing, your existing staff who have had to leave and actually go and get other jobs, I've had probably 10 or 12 of those that have resigned, but in their resignation letter, they absolutely said, "We will. I will be back. I want. I want to work in the travel and tourism industry. It is my passion. It's what I love to do, and this is just interim to earn money." So I think, as much as we're a bit nervous about losing a lot of good people, I think we've lost them for this time, but they will come back. What does concern me, though, um, while we're just on the topic of staff and government, so disaster payment will end soon. Um, the tourism ministry obviously won't recover for, let's say, two, three, four, some project even eight years. Um, so we we'll probably not be able to offer full time hours. We don't have any support from from the government in regards to financials there. How will we be able to get people back to the to the desks to work? Um, also, keeping in mind, we still have a lot of credits outstanding that people want to use in the future, which is great because it brings occupancy, but it doesn't bring new cash. Plus, we still have to deal with cancellations. So there's a lot of work, but there's no money to pay or there's no hours to use to process that. How can we attack that? What's, what are well, your insights? I think it's stages. You know, you've got, first of all, you've got to have the communication with your staff and let them know exactly the position that you're in and give them some kind of roadmap as to when possibly things will turn around and we can start paying them a bit more. Um, so I've, I'm constantly communicating with my staff and, you know, I can see the roadmap myself just with when Victorian um, Queensland opened the corporate the corporates will start travelling. I know we're going into December, January, but I feel this January or January 22 is going to be different to any other January we've had because people are desperate to travel. And I think corporates are going to come back earlier because they're sick of being at home and we'll start to do business. And, you know, I know that all of our corporates are desperate to get on a plane. Um, we've, mm -hmm. we've been putting surveys out recently and... Um, not one of them have said they want to continue doing Zoom. Um, they want to get on a plane and they need to see their customers. And I think mm -hmm. our roadmap is in our business is looking at those those trends and going, okay, this is when I can possibly bring you back for this amount of time and then this is what I can do for full time. Mm. Um, I want to make a slight angle towards international. Um, first of all, if you compare the roadmap to whatever other countries do, 
did you see something that you thought, oh, that's actually amazing, Australia should do that? Stop reporting. No. Stop, stop <laughs> reporting on COVID cases and start reporting on vaccinations. That's what, you know, Singapore started doing that ages ago. We should have mm -hmm. taken that on. But um, I think, you know, the Scandinavian countries have done well, but then they did well and then they've gone backwards. So I think every, every country has had its good and bad days. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think there's a silver bullet to this. I mean, we'll probably look back in five or 10 years and say, okay, <laughs> which state, which country did it best? And I think the stages are very, very different. I mean, if I look at Singapore, uh, you know, they're 92, 93% double vaxxed, yet they've been thrown back into lockdown for a couple of weeks. If I talk to our colleagues in uh, Spain, uh, which I do most nights, you know, they're the second most vaxxed, double vaxxed country in Europe they're back to normality. If I talk to our colleagues in the UK, um, you know, to Penny's point, they're not looking at the death rates, they're looking at the vaccination rates and the opening. Um, I, I think the different stages, uh, I think, well, certainly in New South Wales, I think has led the way in Australia. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully the, the government will just look at the vaccination rates and, and accordingly open up. Uh, mm -hmm. New Zealand took a very hard line approach like Australia did and, you know, uh, she seems to have changed the tune in the last couple of days. Um, so locking out a country for two or three years is just not economically viable. Um, you know, the US uh, just, just seems to be uh, continuing to, you know, if I look at our business globally, the US is back at 50% of pre-COVID mm. numbers. It's the highest number in the world mm. uh, by continent. Um, so, you know, obviously there's numerous uh, indicators, uh, you know, hospitalizations, deaths, sadly. Uh, but if I look at the way the US is operated, it, it just continues to go from strength to strength. Mm. Certainly when I look at the bookings, uh, is it the right thing? Yeah, uh, Tom will tell. Mm. I um, totally agree. I think in a few years time, we'll be able to evaluate you know, what initiatives work best from which countries. Hindsight's 2020, as they say, hindsight's 2020 vision. Um, I think what we've seen in Australia that has worked, and I'm talking from uh, Google search data, so we um, talk about that being a, an effective consumer barometer. Uh, when the government announced the half price flights in April, we saw um, a massive um, surge and peak in um, interest to book domestic flights. And when the New Zealand bubble was announced, um, we saw 15 times more searches from Australia to New Zealand. So um, what I would conclude from that is when there are stimulus packages or initiatives from the government, it does, um, or when restrictions are lifted, it does um, spur on that consumer demand. And that's just because um, I said it before, and Penny also said it, that there is just such a demand for travel. People really want to get back up in the sky and be traveling internationally. Mm. Uh, one thing that I found when I did my research about what international other countries do, obviously I look a lot into Germany, the accent might've given it away. Um, so in Germany, they even sell a uh, rapid test at Aldi, you know, mm. so it's so common everywhere there. Um, first of all, question would be, why does Australia not have rapid tests publicly available yet? And um, would that be the game changer to reduce um, tourists for tourists quarantine? Because I think a big reason why people wouldn't travel to Australia at this stage is obviously um, two weeks or maybe even one week in the future hotel quarantine, which prolongs your holiday significantly. Um, so does anyone have insights on the rapid testing? Maybe Michael, do you know why that's not publicly available yet? Yeah, um, there's still there's still to be uh, um, approved by the TGA. Um, so they, they're definitely in that process at the moment. There's, there's a lot available now, as you know, that you can, you can purchase, but they're still waiting on, on some of those approvals. I think we'll see more of those approvals and I think we will see uh, rapid antigen tests used uh, in, in, in a number of different uh, organisations and industries. Um, it's amazing the pricing. A rap, you can get a rapid antigen test for $6, $6 or $180. Which one would you mm. buy? I can't believe that they can be, you know, if someone said, look, they, they range between $6 and $20, you'd say, yeah, fair enough. But from six to 180 is actually quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That's that's the sort of, uh, uh, I suppose, environment that's being worked on at the moment. But I think they will 
they certainly will be used by organisations for the future. Mm -hmm. I think we will see uh, our international borders will open up and we will be using things like rapid antigen tests, like short term, short term um, quarantine for high risk countries. And I would suggest there'll be no quarantine for those, uh, particularly for those vaccinated that are recognised by Australia. Mm. Oh, it's definitely, for my understanding, definitely crucial for the international part of the tourism recover recovery. Um, so you just mentioned you think it's going to be used at different institutions and companies. Is anyone here actually planning of introducing rapid testing for your staff? Uh, and if you have customers on site, obviously customers or Simon for you students? I think we're still grappling with the vaccination rules <laughs> and regulations. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, looking at uh, to what extent that can actually be implemented um, across the organisation. And, and of course, um, with the university, we have outlets that are open to the public. So we need to obviously work with, with local governments to address how we safely manage those environments, both for customers and students. But I, I certainly think we're not at that stage yet. We're still really wrapping our heads around what we do with our current workforce and our customers to obviously keep them safe and what the rules should actually be and what our legal rights are in relation to how we implement um, the rules. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things we've just advised staff from next week in New South Wales, they can go back, but there are certain criteria to go back. Um, and I think, you know, given the announcement today, we will amend that come next week. Um, and obviously from, you know, the 1st of December, uh, quite a few things change in New South Wales. But when we look at our operations right across the Pacific, we've got to take in local regulatory and government and then apply what we as an organisation are looking to do. You know, I think to, to Simon's point, we haven't even engaged our customers to sort of get their view around their desire or need or want to have, you know, some of our team on site. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, uh, how we reciprocate by having guests into our offices and, and what are the minimum requirements. So, you know, it's, uh, there are a lot of parallel pieces of work to be done. And obviously, you know, um, you know, we have some people who have got, who are compromised with their health. So how do we deal with mm. those individuals as well? And how do we work through those situations? So, you know, I think we've been working on this uh, for months, but the reality is as things change on a regular basis, the question mark is what is the baseline that we will require as an organisation for health and safety of staff, customers, et cetera. Mm. Um, but, you know, in our industry, uh, well, certainly in our company, we have people that are jetting around the world regularly. Uh, we've got customers in India, the Philippines, the Middle East, um, you know, uh, all over the, the Asia Pac region. So what is our responsibility uh, as they may be required to head into some, yeah, possibly high risk destinations? Mm -hmm. So, you know, all that's got to be worked through. Um, yeah, uh, it's not uh, it's not just a, a black and white answer. I think yeah. that's a very fair point, um, especially for those who travel for work, but also obviously protecting our staff uh, dealing with international people. And um, yesterday, Michael, in um, the webinar that I attended with TA, um, there were a few touch points on the complexity from a legal point of view. Um, let's leave them aside mm -hmm. for a second and assume you would have the choice. Would you actually um, only have fully vaccinated people for particular these roads? Fully vaccinated people for what, Timo? Uh, for, for roles that have, for sorry, roles. I should have explained that, right? <laughs> for roles that um, <clears throat> that require a lot of a lot of travel or who get in contact with a lot of international people. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, from my point of view, double vaccination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be a steady approach. I think again, this is going to be milestones. But I mean, my indication to our teams in Australia is that we don't want to put the individual at risk. We don't want to put the customers at risk. And no matter whether you're travelling multi states in Australia, whenever that <laughs> is happening, um, or internationally, there are going to be lots of touch points. So. Mm -hmm. You know the risk for an organisation, if someone was not vaccinated, was to pick some was to pick up COVID, and you know the impacts on that, both short and long term, um, or the worst case scenario that they pass away. You know there are quite a lot of uh, risks associated with that, and there's quite a lot of thought that needs to be put into that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they're all the discussions we're having openly with staff, especially those who are travelling 
historically quite mm -hmm. regularly. And why does the government not not make a call on that? Like, <clears throat> I see, um, obviously, at the moment, until December, everyone has to be fully vaccinated who's allowed to work. After that, it's kind of left with the businesses to make your own risk assessment and to make your own decision. Um, I would just assume probably or a lot of people I speak to share at least the feedback. They would definitely prefer if the government would just make a proper call and say everyone has to be vaccinated unless there's a medical exemption, obviously. Um, why is that not happening? Do we know why the government, or Michael, probably for you, you're probably closest in regards to giving advice to the government. Um, why are they so hesitant to make a call there? No, I, I think it's. I think it does have a lot to do with... Uh, with politics more than common sense in some regards. Um, you know what I mean? They've, they've, they've certainly got to make sure that they look after after all constituents. And, and I think they they still believe that, you know, we are in a, uh, a society of everyone has their own own uh, ability to make their choice. Now, interestingly, I mean, we, we are in New South Wales, you know, anticipating getting 93% of our population vaccinated. That's sort of anticipated by 1 December. Mm -hmm. It will be 93%, which is phenomenal, really. It is quite phenomenal. And, and from the world's perspective, that's phenomenal as well. Do you know what I mean? So I think, uh, I think Australians are, are, are fairly uh, accepting of vaccination. So um, I think in some regards, it, it's almost a case of through this Doherty report, that we should be able to live live life fairly normally and with fairly low uh, rates of transmission and fatality if, if we can get to those levels right around the country. And I think the governments are saying we don't want to have a situation where people have got to be showing I'm vaccinated, I'm not vaccinated, you know what I mean, sort of scenario. I don't want a two-tiered society. So I think I can understand that. It's interesting as well, though, uh, Timo, that you do see government change. And we've seen that in the last few weeks. And when I say government change, actually say we're doing this and then go, oh, oh no, we've got to change direction because we're getting too much pressure from this side or from this side. So they are, they do seem to be uh, malleable and uh, interesting. We, we, we're going to continue to see that for some time, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it does come down to a bit of politics, sad to say. Okay. And I think, Timo, the other the other challenge we're going to have around this is once we finally agree on what those rules and regulations are going to be for the sector, is how they're actually implemented. And we tend to call this the language of service. Mm. And what I think we've learned over the last 18 months, and I think for all of us on, on this particular call, literally every retail outlet or provider that um, you may visit, how they implement the rules and how they actually talk to their, their guests, their customers, their clients around what they can and cannot do substantially varies. So there's probably going to have to be quite a bit of training that's going to have to be done um, to ensure service staff and frontline staff understand the rules and regulations and implement them professionally mm -hmm. and yeah. consistently. I definitely agree with that, yeah. I mean, I mean, interestingly, and I know we discussed yesterday with accommodation, we've been advised over the last, I suppose, uh, eight weeks that you'll need to have, you'll need to be double vaccinated, one, to be able to work in, in a hotel, and two, you'll need to be double vaccinated to have to be double vaccinated to stay in a hotel. And, the, and we've been told that by government for eight eight weeks. Um, we've been asking as for in, as on behalf of industry that we need the public health order because the public health order needs to support that. So it was interesting when the public health order came out this week and indicated that no, well, in actual fact, you can stay in a hotel. You don't have to be double vaccinated to stay in a hotel in accommodation. And here we are sitting there going, how is this backflip? How is this, you know, we've all been advised. So, so then it's gonna come back to the actual, so then, then there's the other variant to that where at the moment, you can only travel if you are double vaccinated as well. So that, that would suggest that sort of has a, a bit of a blanket hold on that. But then you've got the other side of it as well, where I can understand the government's position, because if you're in a, uh, a multi-use building uh, that has short-term accommodation, service departments and residents in the same, then you can't say to everyone in that building, you must be double vaccinated. So in actual fact, They've almost had to put those laws in 
the government have had to put those those laws in to allow the flexibility for those residents that are living in those in those mm. buildings. So that then it becomes back onto the hotel. And if you're operating a fully serviced hotel um, that doesn't have residents, then you would say, right, well, our policy is going to be everyone on site will be double vaccinated, our staff will be double vaccinated, and as will our guests. And when we get to December 1, that's where it's going to become interesting. How many hotels are going to maintain that double vaccination policy going forward? And it's interesting when you start looking at some industries, they say, I'm going to follow the public health order. If the public health order says we don't need to anymore, that's it. Because I've got trouble getting staff. Do I want to restrict how I get staff? And I, I don't want to be in a situation where I could jeopardise revenue because of that policy. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other other uh, hotels that are looking at it saying, maybe it's going to be a marketing edge if I've got that policy. Mm -hmm. So there's still that that uh, imbalance in, in industry as to which way it's going to go. So we're still a little bit of wait and see, that's mm -hmm. for sure. So obviously, <clears throat> Australia has been vaccinated is, is one leg of the recovery. <clears throat> the other one is obviously international vaccination rates. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so, Penny, I know your favourite travel destination, for example, is Mexico. Um, their vaccination rate is around 35 36% currently. Um, is it ethical for us, for the first worlders, to travel into the second and third world? Well, I think it's like any risk assessment when you travel. So, even pre COVID, you know, corporations had their risk assessment policies. And, um, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, there's plenty of software that you can now have that you can pull up a risk assessment map, you can pull up a risk assessment report, even based on what um, airline, what aircraft you're flying in as to what air conditioning they have and what seat you should sit in and what's the safest, where is the safest place to sit. So I think that's just going to continue. The, the whole risk assessment and policies will be put in place around that mm. but for the leisure that's the know? corporate but for the leisure traveler um you know we can only advise that yes mexico only has has this this amount of cases and this amount of vaccinations and that's up to you if you travel um we've just recently changed all our t's and c's with quite a few clauses within those t's and c's to cover us because there is no insurance that professional indemnity is not going to cover us if one of our consultants say absolutely go to Mexico and they get there and they catch COVID and well, the worst happens and then they come back to sue us. Um, so, you know, we've got to be careful as advisors what we advise, but at the end of the day, we've covered that in our T's and C's. Mm -hmm. I think, Timo, that's a, that's a really interesting question because research clearly indicates um, that our younger generations, um, millennials, Gen Ys and so on, are a lot more sort of willing to take risks and a lot more resilient in relation to their travel choices. And look, we saw this in, in Bali as the first market back to Bali was essentially the backpackers. Um, we saw this in Thailand after the tsunami, the first market back in was the backpackers. And we're going to probably see this again and we're already starting to see this with the summer season in, in Europe that uh, has, is, is just winding up now. Again, the younger markets, the millennials, the wise, and so on, the backpackers are returning to popular destinations. And, you know, Ibiza is a great example. And certainly, you know, reading a little bit about what's been happening in Ibiza over the last couple of months, they've done very well. But again, it's the younger generations that are there that are re-engaging with the destination and so on. So I think the, if you like, the concern is more so, you know, making sure that the message is very clear as to the risks involved uh, traveling to these particular destinations for, for these, these travel mm -hmm. markets. Yeah, it, it's interesting question, Timo, because talking to tourism boards across the region, certainly a couple of them have raised how they are going to position their health system if there was to be an outbreak, a greater outbreak, especially in uh, you know, uh, what I would define as third world economies where the, the hospital system, the medical system may not be up to scratch, uh, which I thought was a really interesting conversation that they touched on around how do they 
how are they going to position their country, their locations, uh, given that, you know, uh, for instance, a million Australians used to go to Bali pre-COVID. Uh, now, um, having worked in Bali for the best part of 10 years, you know, I'm not sure that their medical system could cope. So, uh, you know, there are, I suppose, all the moral questions that are going to be asked and answered over the time around how, uh, you know, people are very exuberant to travel. The question mark now is, uh, are they thinking through what could happen if they go into some of these destinations um, uh, for themselves and, and for others as well? But I thought it was interesting. Some of the tourism boards have started to sort of table that. that yeah. talk. I think, we, please go ahead, Michelle. I was going to say, we carry out some sentiment studies um, every month just to see what's top of mind for consumers and what they're thinking about um, when, it, when it comes to travel, both domestically and overseas. And definitely that hygiene and safety factor is top of mind. That keeps coming up um, as something that's critically important for consumers when deciding what destination to go to. And um, on the flip side of that, I think it's a really positive sign for us, especially here in New South Wales, as borders open and we have such a high vaccination rate um, that, you know, uh, travel is coming here. Um, you know, hopefully that will give them more confidence that this is a, a safe destination to come to and, you know, might make it more attractive to come to Australia than perhaps some other destinations. Yeah. Um Unfortunately, running out of time, I would love to talk with each of you for probably another two hours. And I think what we can already see, the roadmap does definitely not cover all aspects that we need covered to be able to fully recover. So um, I think we leave the question mark in the title for now. <laughs> and um, I want to I wanna, um, <clears throat> re-emphasize what Simon actually said. Um, we, we actually need a round table where we all, from all parts of the industry, come together and resolve this together as one industry to get stronger out of this than ever. Mentoring is, as Michael mentioned, a very big part of that. And obviously Penny's time offers that in a structured way. Um, thank you again for your, for your time today, for your insights and your comments. I really appreciate that. And I hope I see you all in person actually very, very soon, unless you are not in NSW. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Timo. Thanks, Timo. Thanks, Timo. Thanks, Timo. Great chat. Bye. Thank you.